Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome, and thanks again for joining us as we continue our mental health series here on the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Uh, to reiterate our objective with this series, we are here to bring you some insight on teenage mental health and teenage mental challenges that they're going through emotionally and socially so that our players are hopefully going to be bettered by us as coaches getting better so that if we as coaches understand what our players are going through, we can help serve them better. So if our job as coaches is not just to make them better basketball players, but also to help make them better people, then we need to make sure that we are aware and we are more knowledgeable about the very real emotional, social, and, and different situations that our players are facing. So our topic today is going to be about recognizing when our athletes, our teenagers are struggling and are going through certain things and how we as coaches can empathize and best support them so that we're another support system for that player to help them out, hopefully. So my guest to help discuss this topic is a therapist and licensed clinical social worker, Eileen Kelleher. Thank you so much for joining us and spending some time today to discuss some teen mental health with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's, I'm really looking forward to this. I, I think that this is just so useful for, for coaches who, I know I, I joke that every day that passes, is another day I forget what it's like to be a teenager. So I think that this is super helpful for, for us to really kind of remember and reflect and also to, to understand kind of the new challenges that maybe teenagers are going through that, you know, you and I and, and other coaches didn't maybe have when we uh, were teenagers. So let's get started with kind of your introduction, kind of your journey, um, whether it's your journey with mental health or, or your journey that led you to become interested in doing what you currently do right now. Yeah, so um, again, I'm Eileen Kelleher. I'm a child and family therapist in Chicago, and I mainly see children, teens, and families who are dealing with depression and anxiety, um, but I have a special interest in working with kids and teens that are gifted or twice exceptional, and twice exceptional just means that they have um, very strong talent in other er one area, but they also have um, some challenges in another. And so I actually see um, teens who do well in school and also excel in sports, but still deal with depression and anxiety. Um, and so when I was a kid, um, I also dealt with uh, mental health challenges of depression and anxiety, and so I wanted to go into the field because when I got a therapist and a psychiatrist, um, it really helped me out a lot, and I was able to see that, you know, a mental health diagnosis or difficulty doesn't have to last forever, that there is a way out, and so that's something that I'm really passionate about and just spreading um, information about it because a lot of kids and teens, there's a stigma associated with um, dealing with mental health issues, like that you're crazy or that you're different and everyone's trying to just fit in and be liked. And so, um, so yeah, just normalizing that for kids and helping them out the best I can. That's um, what I do. That, that, that's great. And, and I think that it's interesting because I didn't know this about the particular um, type that you, you serve. It was the term that you mentioned, was it twice exceptional? Was that the mm -hmm. correct term? Yeah. Can, can you go into that a, a little bit more? What, what, is, what classifies somebody as being twice exceptional? Is there a certain process that goes through for somebody to be, I hate to use the word term labeled, but that's why I use the term classified and, and kind of what that is? Yeah. So there's no like, um, standardized definition of it. It's a term that um, 
parents and other people who work with kids with high abilities developed because they were seeing that there were kids who were very strong, like let's say they're a very good dancer, a very good athlete, or very um, intellectually advanced um, or advanced in writing. They saw kids with all these abilities, but then they would also struggle with like ADHD, autism, learning difficulties, um, emotional um, and mental health issues, um, physical disabilities. So people kind of created this term as a way to um, kind of help people have a community around it and help parents get help because it's very difficult mm -hmm. sometimes being a parent of a kid who has you know such big strengths but also um, challenges that you have to deal with mm -hmm. so yeah so is there for parents who are kind of concern that that their child or, or you know, child that they know might, might kind of fall into that category is there something in particular that that they should be looking for i know you said it's really broad but if mm -hmm. a child has you know exceptional talents at something but is struggling in other areas are there kind of commonalities are there things that in particular like parents might want to be just just aware of or, or cognizant of yeah so in terms of social emotional um characteristics usually kids and teens with um who are twice exceptional or 2e uh they are very intense they have a lot of intensity of um attention in in terms of what they're interested in but also intensity of emotion so they feel things very strongly sometimes that means they have more tantrums or behavioral difficulties um, they're very sensitive as well to what's going on around them. Um, so sometimes that can be also um, noticing that they have some, like get overwhelmed by certain sensory things um, like lights or sounds. Um, and then I think that also sometimes like kids, particularly those with um, high intelligence in some areas tend to get along better with adults or with um, other kids who have similar strengths mm -hmm. um, because sometimes they can't relate to other kids who um, have different interests in them. So, so those are some of the, I feel like, main indicators that um, something it could be helpful to uh, maybe get some testing done or at least um, get some support. I think that's the main thing is letting parents know that they can reach out for support, that they don't have to do it alone, mm -hmm. and that they're not like bad parents or something, that they're just dealing with children who are exceptional. And um, that requires, you know, more skills and more support. Right. Well, I, I think that's interesting because oftentimes I feel like there might be some sort of like stigma with those who are highly like successful in some area that like things about their personality oh like those are just their quirks and those are just things that are just you know come with them being highly successful at something or having a lot of talent in something whereas some of these you know quirks for lack of a better word are actually things that may need to be discussed and may need to be like developed and tested and, and looked at further and not just dismissed as like oh that's just you know a quirk that they have yeah, that's a good point that sometimes it can show that they may, may need help in an area, but also sometimes it can be helpful to normalize the fact that kids who are very talented are sometimes just a little different. They are just mm -hmm. a little quirky or um, march to the beat of their own drum, and mm -hmm. that's okay as well, as long as it's not causing them harm, you know? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that's a good point is, is being able to, you know, understand whether it's causing them harm and whether that's kind of like you said, like with social or, or, or any other like sort of development like harm. I think, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, like that's kind of where you need to step in and, and just be aware of whether that's happening. So uh, thank you yeah. for bringing that up. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'll, I'm sure I'll mention that, that, that some more because that, that's a new term to me. It's twice exceptional. So I'm sure to some people listening, that term might, might be new as well. But, but that's, that's really interesting. So yeah. uh, to, to kind of start, um, in your in your area in your area of focus uh, with dealing with you know issues like depression anxiety or just overall behavioral issues in, in your experience um, doing this 
Have there been areas that you've seen an increase in over time? Are there certain trends that you may have noticed with teenagers in particular that maybe you're dealing with now more than you ever were before? Yeah, I think for me, what I've seen increase is anxiety in kids and teens. Um, that something that people used to think was just more um, something that plagued adults who were stressed out with all the demands of life. Now it's really a child and teen issue that's helpful to be aware of. Um, in terms of statistics, one in three teens will experience an anxiety disorder, which is a huge amount of kids. And so mm -hmm. I think it's important to um, help parents and coaches and other people that are important to kids to be able to um, kind of notice when something may be off or difficult for them and um, to let them know that they, you know, there's help. Um, but yeah, like a lot of it, I think the increase can come, a lot of kids that I see get very stressed about standardized tests, um, about a lot of pressure at school um, in terms of doing well academic, academically. They're always comparing themselves to others which social media doesn't always help with, you know. I hate mm -hmm. to make social media like the culprit because a lot of people love to do that. And I think mm -hmm. that it can be helpful for kids in certain ways, but the comparison aspect, the number of likes and followers, that can be a place where kids will get anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, I think, just the stress of the world. I mean, we know right now with COVID that that adds to kids' stress. There's also more drills about school shootings um, and just like violence in the news and things that kids see and hear about can all add to their um, sense of anxiety. Yeah. So with anxiety, I, I want to clarify for just, just to make sure that, that, that we're kind of clear in, in, in being able to identify that so that other coaches might be able to be aware of it. Is What's the difference in, in, in your experience with somebody who, who has anxiety versus just somebody who is just like nervous? I know that it's easy for us to say like, oh, you know, they just worry too much and just like get over it versus like, no, this is anxiety and this is something that's actually like debilitating and really negatively affecting this child's life. Yeah, I think that um, sometimes that can be found in um, constant, like if you notice they're having concentration difficulties, like where they used to be, you know, just doing really well in a sport, and now all of a sudden they have trouble focusing or um, are, their performance has changed in some way. I think that can be a really good indicator. I think also um, if their grades are dropping, um, that also has to do with the difficulties in concentration that anxiety brings. Um, if they mention that they're having trouble with sleeping, um, that's another indicator whether they're sleeping too little or too much. Um, and then there's the, the hallmark is just kind of excessive worry about things. So they may be worried about their performance <clears throat> like on the team, but also if you hear them just talking about being worried about a lot of things that um, seem to be out of their control, but they can't really stop themselves from worrying about it. That's when I kind of, you know, look to see, okay, is there um, more to this? Um, and then if it seems to be paralyzing, like they literally, like let's say you have a basketball game and they literally just can't go onto the court because mm -hmm. they're having a panic attack or something. Mm -hmm. um, that's when, you know, more steps need to be taken. But I think it's also helpful to talk to the people in the kid's life, like their teachers and their parents, because usually anxiety disorders are characterized by being present in more than one, like, location in a child's life um and so talking to those other people can help clarify what may just be something like you know nervousness or jitters before a game and what could actually be something more serious well that's a really true point that you mentioned and that i know i've struggled at uh, at times and I'm, I'm a teacher and a coach but but sometimes i know that when we see a player like on our team who just having like an off night and they, they seem like really like 
anxious or nervous, we kind of tend to look at it through like the lens of like basketball, like, oh, they're just, you know, not focusing on, on this or they're not trying or this, that or the other. But really, there's a chance that it might be something much greater than that. And that, you know, inattentiveness is also, like you said, prevalent, you know, in their home life and in their classroom experience. And that for coaches, it's, it's really important, it seems, as best we can to make sure that we're connecting with those other adults in the child's life so that we can kind of get a better, like kind of more of a complete picture of like what's going on with, with, our, with that particular child. Yeah, for sure. I know a lot, like um, multiple kids I've seen really see their coaches as kind of like mentors and even sometimes like therapists in a way, like they'll say, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk to my coach about things that I won't talk to anyone else about, or they see their coach as being the main support in their life. And so I think it's, yeah, it's great to kind of see coaches as one of those um, supports that's really important and that can also be helpful in um, pointing out something that needs to be worked on. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and sometimes we don't really realize that as coaches. I, I think that we don't maybe often realize that the bond that we can create with our players and to realize that the way that our players communicate with us may not be a way that they would ever communicate at home or with a teacher of somebody else and that the relationship and that bond between the player and, and the coach could be one that they don't really have with everyone else. So I think that's really, really good that you mentioned that. It's a good reminder to us as coaches about the potential that we can have to kind of be that role model adult figure in, in a child's life. So yeah. I want to try and, and, and equip coaches a, a little bit as best as we can to kind of be able to recognize and, and understand when our players are dealing with things that are, you know, beyond just basketball or beyond our sport. So is there a way that coaches can recognize when their players are in maybe a difficult home situation or dealing with with trauma of some sort. We certainly don't want to make assumptions about our players' home lives, but are there things that we can look for and recognize to, to kind of put the light bulb in our head that something something greater is going on in this child's life? Yeah, I think, um, so it depends, I think, on the severity of what's going on at home. You you may just see like a mood change and like we talked about with anxiety, like a difference in performance but if there is like a traumatic situation at home then you may see more serious changes like hearing about one of your players that engages in like high-risk activities um, whether that be um, through driving through um, like drinking or doing drugs or being like more sexually risky, uh, even though those are hard things to talk about, I feel like those are things that um, are very strongly associated with kids who are going or going through or have gone through trauma at home. Mm -hmm. um, there can also be like chronic physical issues. So if they're always having stomach aches or always having headaches, that can be a sign that there's something um, deeper emotionally going on. Um, I think that also kind of aggressiveness or violence, whether that be with other people on the team, um, people from other, like other teams or other schools, um, that can be an indicator that there's violence going on in another area of their life because that's the main way that they see to resolve conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be indicative of something else. Um, not always, but that's just another sign. Also self-injury. So um, mm. if you're starting to notice like cuts on uh, kids or just more, um, yeah, more injuries than usual, or if you notice bruises or things like that, um, that's another sign that there is something else going on, um, yeah, at home or emotionally. 
to look out for. Mm. Um, and then unfortunately there's hopefully, you know, coaches don't have to deal with this or go through with this, but, um, sometimes there will be a child who actually acts out sexually, like towards another teammate or, um, is the victim of, uh, like sexually coercive behavior on the team. And that can also be a sign of um, past abuse. So you would hope that you would never have to deal with that, but um, it can happen more than you think. So, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, that is, it is the reality, you know, of, with so many coaches, you know, working with so many teenagers, unfortunately, like you said, t statistically speaking, there will be a, a coach of, especially if you broaden it beyond basketball of any sport who probably is going to encounter already has encountered players who unfortunately um, engage in some of these behaviors because of, of trauma or things that are going on in their home life. So it's definitely something good that we're, aware of and and at least have in our minds now i think one of the things that coaches struggle with is when they hear about these things to engage in that conversation without pushing too hard or without alienating or, or making the kid like feel like they're they're being like targeted or, or being picked on or, or that they feel like something is like oh there's something's wrong with them because the coach is asking questions now i know a lot of this comes down to the relationship that a, that a player and a coach have but is there i guess would you recommend that that a coach tries to have that conversation with a player if, if they know that they're engaging in some of these behaviors or does it go a little bit further beyond just talking to the player? And I know that there's the whole issue of mandatory reporting and things like that, but, but just in terms of the conversation between the coach and the player, if they kind of know or hear about the player engaging in these behaviors, especially if the player says it themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it's interesting because a lot of times coaches um, can be seen as more like, protectors than other people in kids lives and so sometimes they can be more comfortable going to an adult who seems to um, have some power but also cares about them um, and so I think that bringing it up in a way that um, because sometimes if we uh, like allude too much towards what we're what we think may be happening it can mm -hmm. um be somewhat coercive and sometimes kids will want to please us by answering in a way that they think we want to hear so if they think that sometimes an adult wants to hear that there's something going on at home they'll um say that when there's not all that's not always the case so just being i think being open about like hey, I've noticed this, is there anything going on? Or do you wanna talk about it? Like even those very broad statements um, can open the door for kids to say something. And at first they may be caught off guard and not know anyone noticed or not think anyone cared. And they'll be like, no, I'm fine, I'm good. But just the fact that you opened up that conversation, later on they may come back and be like, you know, when you ask that or, hey, can I talk to you about something? Just knowing that their coach cares about them in a way other than just basketball or baseball or football, um, but that they care about them and their well-being in general, that kind of helps open up the space for kids to talk when they're ready to talk. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, uh, uh, to, to kind of add on to that and to kind of get, get your perspective on it, I think one of the things that I know coaches and, and teachers and adults in general struggle with is that when the kid says, oh, like, no, I'm fine or no, nothing's happening, but the adult, I don't want to say knows, but they're very, very certain that something is happening. It's important and I want you to, uh, I would like for you to clarify this to make sure I'm understanding, right? It, I think it's important that we as adults don't push too hard correct like there's a certain point where if the player isn't going to open up any further there, there's no amount of like pushing that that's going to just extract that out of them am, am i correct in that thinking yeah i think an important thing about trauma or kids who are going through something difficult at home is that 
choice, them having a choice about who they tell and when they tell is very important to their healing because sometimes if they are like the victims of abuse, they don't have choice in that and they don't have, um, they're not giving consent. And so for them to be able to feel like you're there for them when they're ready, I think that that's a lot healthier of a way of approaching it as opposed to being like, I know what's going on, like tell me, because then it kind of puts them again in a situation of being in trouble or um, of being the problem, which they're probably already told, mm -hmm. as opposed to you really just being very open um, and, you know, wanting what's best for them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I think that's, that's really, really good to know that we as coaches, like just, just being there and just being a support that's around when, you know, that particular child is ready, if they get to that point is, is super helpful. And that, I think it's, I think I know I, I've kind of struggled a little bit with, you know, like I said, if I know something is happening, that, you know, I, I really just want to do more, but at the same time, understanding that I may only have been that player's coach for like a year and they may be having stuff that's going on their whole life, you know, 15, 16 years. Like it, it, it's not something that, you know, it's, I'm going to be able to just flip the switch and, and try and, you know, bring all of this out because as you could probably speak to, there, there's no telling how long some of these like traumas, some of these issues have been going on for. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not an easy fix either. Mm -hmm. So it's like, even if you do hear about it, it's mm -hmm. not like, oh, we make the bad person go away and mm -hmm. then things are better. Um, it right. takes a lot more for healing to occur. So with that, if a player does, you know, kind of open up to us and, 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 and give us a little bit of insight about what's going on, I know that there could be a little bit of gray area in this. And so it's, it's kind of tricky. Maybe it's more of a case by case thing, but are there certain things that are instant as in like a coach needs to report this? I alluded to mandatory reporting earlier where like this has to go beyond just a conversation between the player and the coach versus like kind of in between. And that maybe we'll, you know, check in on the parents. Like, is there some kind of like guideline that maybe coaches could be thinking about in their mind? Yeah, um, I know that mandatory reporting can be different from state to state, mm -hmm. but I think one rule of thumb is that if you see or suspect that they are, um, like if they have bruises or you see evidence of physical abuse on their bodies, that that is something that you have to report. Um, also hearing from them that someone has assaulted them in some way, whether um, that be sexually or otherwise, that's something that has to be reported. Um, but then there's harder issues like kids who witness domestic violence or um, kids who, you know, frequently get into like shouting matches with their parents or something like that, where it's not as clear as to um, whether it's more helpful to talk to the family um, or to go that more severe route of um, making a call. Uh, I think for me, when it's not clear that abuse is occurring, um, I tend to steer towards working with a family as opposed to calling DCFS. Um, I definitely call when it's mandatory and when there is um, a serious problem, but I've also worked within the foster care system mm -hmm. and I know that it's a system that has a lot of issues. And so if things can be worked out on the family level, that's great. I think that coaches being able, usually at schools, there's like a school social worker or counselor. If coaches are able to get just like a printout um, or an email with a list of resources in the area to give to like kids or their families if you if they come to you with something or if you hear about something happening I mean sometimes the parents may even come to you yeah. you know after a game or something and so um, if you can have those things on hand that can be helpful in helping um, parents and families get what they need mm -hmm. and, I, and I think something that's also important to consider with that because that, that that was really great and I'm, I'm glad you i'm glad you mentioned those, those particular areas and, and one of the things i know that 
has been tough for me as a teacher, as a coach, but I know as a mandatory reporter that I have to do this is that if a player comes up to me with something, you know, and then I've had players and, and, and students come up to me and say like, Hey, like this and this is going on, but like, can we keep it between us? Like there is, if you're going to be a mandatory reporter and there are things you have to report, you, you can't just necessarily keep all things between like the two parties. Uh, I think that's correct in most cases, probably mm -hmm. across the states of mandatory reporting. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I have to tell my clients um, who are kids and teens is like, I, you know, what's what, there are certain things that are confidential and can stay between us, but if I, you know, if you say that you're harming yourself or have plans to harm yourself or to harm someone else, I have mm -hmm. to report that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are situations where, you know, a teen will tell me that they're planning suicide and really want to die and I have to, you know, let their parents know and make a plan for what to do because, um, it's a serious situation. And if, if a teen is telling you that, they, they're reaching out for help before they do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like our job as adults to help them get that help. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's complicated. There are a lot of complicated situations, um, especially, yeah, like, I don't know. Sometimes I think that systems tend to criminalize or penalize families for things like being poor or um, just not having the same access to resources that wealthier families have. And so in those cases, it's like, how can we get a family food? You know, how can we get a family housing as opposed to um, acting like, you know, there's something wrong with the parents mm -hmm. or some, there's something wrong with the family. Mm -hmm. Well, you bring up you bring up a great point that if those needs aren't met of like housing and, and food and some of those basic necessities, there are going to be a lot of these other behaviors that are going to manifest out of it. And, you know, sometimes these situations that are caused, like you said, due to you know lack of money or lack of resources, lead to you know high stress and like high anxiety situations that occur. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, kind of kind of with that, and I know that there's a lot of coaches. Um, and, and those who are listening to who deal with, you know, players or are in environments that are kind of low SES and, and like, like we just mentioned, th those needs aren't necessarily being met. And so sometimes home is a really stressful environment and the parent or the parents and the players may not necessarily have the best relationship because of different things going on. Well, one of the things that, you know, we as coaches want to make sure that we're doing to help a player is to make sure that the player, the family, and the coach are kind of all working together. Um, is, there, is there anything that you could recommend that we as coaches try to do to work with parents and families if we know that our players aren't necessarily in, like, the best home environment and maybe that player and that parent really don't have the best relationship? Yeah, I think that um, one of the things that can be helpful that I try to use as well with parents is finding what they value or what they care about and appealing to that. So um, depending on what their own self-interest is, that can be a way into working on bigger changes. Um, and then if, you know, you show that you really that you're not trying to get people in trouble, that you really do care and just want to do what's best, um, that can be helpful. But there's also a history sometimes of um, people coming in to be do-gooders in certain communities and actually causing more harm. So I think we need to just be aware of that there is that um, implication and that so there's a lot of trust that has to be built between us and between families, not just players, you know, um, I'm saying we like I'm a coach. I'm not a coach, but, <laughs> I get a you. Lot, but yeah, as a, when I was a social worker, more working like directly um, with families, I, that's something that you have to overcome. There's a lack of trust there and for good reason. And so I think trying to, um, empathize with families and see where they're coming from as opposed to automatically demonizing them or being like you know you're the reason this is happening mm. um yeah yeah uh and 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 kind of as we've talked about before like these things take time there's a lot of 
previous bad experiences that families may have had or players may have had. And if you're somebody's coach and, and you've been in their life for a month, <laughs> that, that trust isn't necessarily going to be there. there. There's a lot more that, you know, as a coach, you're going to have to kind of prove before that family may even let you like a little bit in. Yeah, I think also like not just going to them when there's problems, but going mm -hmm. to them when their child is doing well, you know, can be a way to in because, you know, it's kind of also making them feel good. Like, oh, I'm doing something right. My child is doing well in this or my child's improving. It makes, it just kind of um, helps them really feel like you're seeing them as a whole person and not just someone to come to complain to. Right. And I know as a teacher that a lot of parents kind of have that fear where if they know a phone call home or there's a phone call going home from, you know, the school or from a coach that they're conditioned to just assume it's going to be a negative and they're already like defensive or they're already just exasperated because they've maybe dealt with phone calls like that for a long time and so just breaking that cycle and just saying like they did something really well like just might ch shift uh the perception that they may have for for that coach in that situation so i think that's a yeah. good point um i want to i want to touch on something you said because uh I, I just i'm curious about it uh what did you mean when, by by the term like do-gooders i, I want to make sure that we're not <laughs> We're not trying to either, you know, say empty words as coaches or to try to like do too much or just say things just to say things. Um, what did you mean by like do-gooders and kind of like what's like, I guess like what are those like empty words? Is, is that what I'm getting at? I'll, I'll let you yeah. clarify it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it has to do with um, just, I mean, so for me, um, as a social worker, there is a history of, um, you know, a lot of social workers uh, historically have been white women going into black and brown communities, kind of trying to um, fix things or uh, help out. And I put like quotes around that because a lot of times if you're not from the community, if you're just coming in and judging it based on the standards that you grew up in or based on your values, then there's a lot of opportunities to do a lot of harm, um, such as something like what we talked about earlier that, you know, if you find out that a child is like in their house, um, they're sharing a bed with two of their siblings and sometimes they miss meals, as a social worker, you let's say you call DCFS and let's say DCFS comes, investigates, takes the child away from their parents, like that causes more harm than seeing where the parent is coming from. The parent is working, you know, two to three minimum wage jobs to make ends meet and they're doing the best they can for their family. Like, are there other ways that we can help try and, um, change the systems that are causing these issues mm. so i think it's just like a matter of um really letting letting the people that you're working with and that you're trying to help lead the um charge for what they need instead of you coming in and telling them what they need mm. um so if you are noticing an issue with their child like it's okay to bring it up, but also ask them, what do you think they need? Or what would be help? Or how can I help? What would be helpful for me? Instead of being like, I think they need you to show them more love. It's like, okay, what are you saying? I'm not a good parent, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's all about your approach and your values and really continuing to try and learn and grow about the communities you work in and really mm -hmm. be someone who's standing with them um, and not against them. Well, it's it's a great point that you mentioned about how coaches and, 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 and teachers too really should like make the effort to, to familiarize their, themselves with the area because I, I know plenty of coaches who I've talked to and, and know personally who moved, you know, to different situations, moved to different states, moved to different communities to teach and coach and, and do all those different things. And, you know, for a lot of these communities, like you're, you're an outsider. Um, and in some of these communities, 
you could probably speak to this too, that there might be a lot of teachers or, you know, coaches who just kind of come in and out and they go into a community and then they're there for like a year or whatever, and then they just leave. And so there already might be, it's, it seems in some communities, a lack of like trust in the sense where they might think that, you know, this new coach or this new teacher is coming in, like they're just going to be gone in a year. So like, why even bother like opening up or talking to them about every, anything? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, yeah, that's the case also with um, therapists who like work in nonprofits where there is high turnover is people will be like, you know, it's hard for kids to sometimes make a connection with you because they know you're transient and will probably mm-hmm. leave after a year. Um, and it's not the kid's fault. It's not the therapist's fault. It's, you know, a larger system yep. issue. So. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, I think it's just something to, to, to be aware of is, you know, what, like you said, like educate yourself on the community, educate yourself on, on, on what's going on. And, and if, if you're really committed to it, you you got to have to be, you're going to have to be patient. It's going to take time. Like you said, there is no like quick fix to some of these issues, especially as we both know, these issues go far beyond just the families, you know, some of these are their neighborhoods, societal, like huge complex issues. And, and we can't necessarily, like you said, try try and be a savior and, and think that we're doing something good when really like we're just adding harm by, by putting families in a, in a worse situation with some of the things we try to do. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I think overall coaches are kind of like a safe haven for mm-hmm. kids and yeah. sports and after school activities. It's like, You can, you know, you have a place to go after school. You have things to do. You're building your self-esteem. You're learning. Like, Mm -hmm. I think that the kids I've met with who deal with depression and anxiety, one of the, um, like, interventions that I do is suggesting they get involved in after-school activities um, and get involved in a sport because, it is so great one physically just to get out those stress hormones but then also they learn values about like teamwork about respect about how to treat other people about patience you know that hard work pays off um they learn social skills about how to interact with others um it improves their self-esteem it makes them feel like they're worth something like sports are so awesome so i just think that yeah, like you said before, like coaches just being aware of how much of a positive impact they can have on kids um, and how valuable they are. Yeah, all, all those things are absolutely true. You know, it gives, like, like I, I've said so many times, that sports and coaching like is just a vehicle for to, to give kids more skills that they're going to use later in their life, like whether it's teamwork, working with others, perseverance, and things like that. And it's a great environment and something great for, for, for kids to have the opportunity to do, especially those, like you said, the, the ones that you particularly work with. And then also, um, you know, kind of, kind of bluntly, you know, if, if a kid's home life isn't necessarily that great, like them being able to do a sport and, and do an activity kind of gives them some time where maybe they're not necessarily in, in that environment as much as they normally would if they were just going to like go home after school kind of blunt but but it is it is the true I've, I've had players say that like it's it's better for them to be on the court than you know just to go home at, right after school so yeah no that's why you see people fighting for after school programs and stuff because it is so important mm-hmm. for kids and it gives them stuff to do because when you're bored it's like you'll come up with things that aren't always as healthy yeah um, yeah but I think yeah. that's true for you know low income and rich areas like yep. Working with kids who come from wealthy families, a lot of times they want to get out of the house, you know, too. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. Like giving structure and, and, and something to do that's that's, you know, I consider productive. Is playing sports is productive, yeah. and, and and just giving them something that's like healthy too. Like you said, get them going and something that that's positive. Hopefully, we're making it a positive experience as coaches as well. So. Um, all of this kind of made me think of, think of a question just for the, for the coaches and the adults themselves. You know, we a lot of times are dealing with kids who, who are going through a lot and, and we're, we do the best that we can um, to be an advocate for them, to help them. But there's 
a lot that that's going into this and there's a lot that you know the reality is that we're not necessarily going to to maybe make huge changes we can make some but we're not going to maybe necessarily make those societal changes uh overnight or anything like that how do you and and how can coaches prevent like this mental burnout or like this mental like feeling of just like nothing i do is working and like all of these things are still happening and and just is there a way in in your experience of working with social workers and therapists and just adults in general can just like keep going when they feel that like everything is falling apart around them yeah i think that um one of the things that can be helpful and this can be helpful for kids too is just mm -hmm. like taking a step back to when you notice you're starting to feel a certain way naming that feeling and then also paying attention to the physical response that happens um and then kind of tracking okay when does this continue to happen and trying to find out the trigger for those situations um because sometimes you know we can get overwhelmed and want to quit every time a certain thing happens um and then i think that from knowing about those triggers you can learn how to pause and respond as opposed to react because i think when we're in that fight or flight mode all the time that's when we start to get burnt out and that's when we start to lose it and so um you know for coaches and players i think that incorporating some amount of mindfulness um practice whether that's you know being aware um, or just naming like five things you see, smell, touch, and hear, or whether that's taking a minute at the beginning of each practice and having kids focus on their breathing. Those like small things can help start to um, have people be more aware of their thoughts and feelings and then be able to pause when something really uh, upsets them and to kind of be able to respond as opposed to react yeah uh, it, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because for those who, who listened to an uh, interview i did with dr cannon that was one of the things she said was just breathing <laughs> and that's exactly what you mentioned too is just just pausing and, and just taking a breath and and I, I like that you mentioned how it's kind of this fight or flight thing, but like you have to step back, name what it is, and, and just give yourself some time time to regroup. I, I think that a lot of times, um, and you, you can attest to this, at least I know for me, if there's these certain like emotional or, or mental like overwhelming thoughts that happen, there's usually also like a physical feeling that I feel of that anxiousness too. And so I think just that mindfulness of taking a step back can not only just help mentally, but also kind of like physically reset you as well and kind of get you a little bit back on track. Yeah, I think also sometimes we have this expectation that people are supposed to be, feel good all the time and we're supposed to be able to like do our job perfectly without mistakes and everything runs smoothly. And like, we forget that in general, life is not like that. Like life is, you know a lot of different feelings and experiences you interact with a lot of different people and who are all in different places and that there's going to be times when you're upset when you cry when you're unhappy when you're frustrated and that that doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something wrong it just means you're human and dealing with um you know situations that come up for people and so it's okay to give yourself a break and not expect that, you know, you're supposed to feel like the best coach in the world all yeah. the time, you know? Yeah. And, and I think going along with that, and, and, and you can add to this too, is that I think it helps players if they maybe not necessarily see you upset, but, but you as a coach are yeah. willing to talk about things that like, Hey, like this is what's upset me. Or like, these are things that I've dealt with. And like also kind of going through like how you processed it as a coach and kind of like how you like were able to work with it because I think sometimes players and students might get this perception that like adults are like never crying, they have it all figured out, they're like perfect and that it, it could be a little bit overwhelming for, for that teenager to just think that like, oh man, like this coach or whatever, they have it all figured out and they don't go through anything and that if we as coaches and as teachers can kind of explain 
you know, the actual feelings we're going through and explain how we're kind of going through those and how we're kind of coping. I, I think it might reassure our, our, our players a little bit that like, oh, okay, like adults go through this too. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I tell parents that all the time to like, like kids know, hey, I'm getting frustrated, you know, I'm going to step over here and take five deep breaths, you know, mm -hmm. so you're modeling it for them, because that's one of the best ways that kids learn is when they see people they respect doing certain things, they feel like it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of like, val yeah, absolutely, there's like a validation with it, like, okay, like, this feeling, like, this adult feels it too, and this is how they do it, and they're, 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 it just kind of creates a little bit more of a connection that way so yeah that that's great yeah. uh, so to, to kind of rework this back into 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 something you know encouraging and positive we know that players are in situations you know especially like on the court or, or in games like high pressure situations where you know they're, they're going to feel you know anxious or, or upset or, or get down on themselves and and we know that these feelings are going to be really amplified if our players are coming in already struggling with anxiety or, or, or depression or other, other things of that nature. So is there a way that you recommend that, that coaches can be encouraging and positive, but at the same time also kind of coaching them through these feelings? Because we don't want to you know, invalidate their feelings. Absolutely not. But we want to try and be the best models we can, I guess, to kind of coach them through it and kind of be encouraging and positive and, and help them the best that they can. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, what you mentioned, the word validation is very important. Like that if, you know, like a kid gets upset and storms off or something, um, that it's okay to talk to them and tell them, you know, we all feel upset or frustrated at times. Like it's okay to feel those emotions. Um, and then as they talk about it, you know, validating that, naming the emotion they're feeling, asking where they feel it in their body. Um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes talking about the physical things can be difficult with kids who may have experienced abuse, but at least naming the emotion. And then, um, letting them know that even though they may feel that way their reaction is not okay so like if like let's say they start you know talking badly to a teammate or something mm -hmm. you can say i know what it's like to get upset when you feel like someone's done something unfair and you know let them say what they're gonna say you know yeah i, I felt that way too but on our team we don't you know say words like that to each other we respect each other or on our team we you know stick with what we're doing until the end of practice or something like that like just letting them know their feelings are okay but that their behavior um needs to change and i think that's where also um just talking about reacting versus responding can be helpful um that you know that pause before we do something is very important um, and that it's okay to do nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So you're uh, what? One of the things you're recommending, which which I think um, would would be really helpful, and, and you can clarify if I made a mistake on that, is is to validate the feeling that the player is feeling, but not condoning the behavior that they're exhibiting. Am, am I correct in that? Yeah, because that's something that like. That's just a life skill that people who have been through trauma or haven't are going to have to learn at some point. And so, um, like, even if there is a lot of stuff going on at home, those kids still need to be able to learn that um, their emotions are okay, but that they also need to work on managing how they behave or how they act as a result of those emotions. Um, because even if you've been through a lot, you know, and are dealing with a lot, like that's totally valid and there's help for that, but you also like can't hit someone from the other team or something, you know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense is that like, establishing, you know, the, the, those behaviors and, and, and establishing what's okay and what's not okay. And I think as, as coaches, one of the things that we can do, it sounds like is kind of give, 
tools in our players toolbox of like correct behaviors that they can do so that they don't like automatically defer to like you said like hitting somebody or, or, or cussing at somebody and that it our players may not necessarily know what those tools are like we can say like do the right thing but if, if, if those players don't have those tools at their disposal like it sounds like they might not even know like what other course of action they should be taking right yeah how can you do the right thing when your emotions take over you know mm -hmm. right and so having those tools at the disposal be like okay i feel this way but like i'm gonna choose to do this and then hopefully if the coach has that relationship then that discussion can take place and and, and also i think that we we should as coaches and, and i can let you add on to it also understand that like if a player is really upset and and they're they're like in a high pressure situation and they're really upset that we might not be able to have that conversation with them like at that moment like they may have chosen the right behavior but they're like they're really upset and like they, they might not be able to have a productive conversation with a coach at that moment and it might be something that has to be revisited later down the line mm -hmm. yeah totally i think it's okay to give people time to cool down because also um, when people are really upset, they sometimes their like verbal comprehension just goes offline because their brain is like their amygdala is just taking over. And so they really can't even hear what you're saying. Like mm. a lecture isn't going to work. Like we have to wait till everyone is like calmer and then they can process that. So that is so interesting that you mentioned because <laughs> there is so much discussion that i've heard about coaches and how much <laughs> they talk to their players after like let's just say like a really tough loss and you know there, there's a lot of dialogue that's like your players aren't even listening to you because they're upset they're upset that they lost they're upset about this that or whatever that happened and like they're not even ready to have that conversation and so you know i i remember i would have a conversation sometimes with my girls after like a really tough loss it'd be like a five minute conversation and like i can guarantee you they probably heard none of it because they just yeah. weren't ready to hear that conversation but if i waited till the next day or after they had time to process it i probably would have been able to get a lot more out of them <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that really makes sense. Yeah. So to wrap up, what I, what I wanted to, to kind of give you the, the opportunity to do, and I, I know this is very general, but in, in general, is there some sort of a, a strategy or some sort of tip that you could recommend for adults or players or both to kind of keep in mind in terms of like managing emotions or behavior, just something that they might want to have as a tool at their disposal? I know you mentioned one earlier. Mm hmm yeah, I think that um, one of the main ways that I think, especially with coaches and kids, that, that can help them learn about their behaviors is just naming them, validating them, and then redirecting them to a different response. Uh, and it could even be just something as simple as breaking down the difference between reacting and responding just so that they start to realize, oh, I have a choice, you know, or, or I can calm myself down until I have more of a choice. Um, but just kind of really uh, kind of instating that value um, on the team and also just in life that, you know, it's important to slow ourselves down and be aware of our emotions so that we can respond in a way that doesn't harm others. I think can be really important and then like you said modeling that for kids as a coach um and yeah i, I just that's something that um is some is more simple and like palatable for kids so yeah uh, love it uh, especially you know the, the kind of reaffirming the idea of like modeling behaviors it's 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 funny if if players and, and people you've worked with who look at coaches as role models well it's because of some of the, the behaviors we as coaches are modeling and so one of the things that that i hear and, and have talked about on, on this podcast and, and coaches say all the time is that players and probably in particular teenagers they pick up everything and they recognize everything and they recognize the way that you know adults are acting and, and, and 
what their actions are and something that has come up over and over again in these series of interviews and, and you may have had experience with this as well with the, with the teens you've talked to is that there are cases where coaches will say something that they think is just completely like off the cuff and just was something off the top of their head but it was a throwaway remark but that was the remark that the, that stuck with that kid and that was the thing that they remembered and luckily for for the coaches i've talked to is always a positive one but i think that that's also something to be aware of and, and again you can probably speak to this that teens and kids in particular they're kind of watching and they're noticing and they'll pick up on like everything it seems yeah yeah our words matter our actions matter and yeah, especially kids who are really good at sports, they may be more sensitive to criticism. And so just being aware to try and be encouraging. Um, it's, okay, it's okay to point out places to improve, but just making sure you're also pointing out the good things they're doing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about that a lot about like they have to know that you care. And then like you can probably have that that conversation more but if the relationship isn't there and you're just sound like you're criticizing all the time like uh, it, it's probably not going to be the most productive conversation right yeah totally so uh to wrap up i want to give uh what i call my, my 60 second like soapbox where i'm going to give you the floor to to get out uh, whatever your thought is to to reiterate something emphasize something a closing thought just something that you think that all of us uh listening should should keep in mind yeah, sure. Um, something that's come up in my head during this talk, this, this is probably more of an anecdote, but I was watching that um, documentary about the Bulls. Um, I forget what it was called, The Last Dance. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that Phil Jackson kind of is, has a very like, as a coach, a very like kind of spiritual approach in a way, or he would emphasize um, techniques that help uh, to slow people down and kind of reflect on what they're doing. And I think that mindfulness exercises can be really helpful in sports and especially for, you know, kids who may be having some blockages um, when they're dealing with sports. But I don't know. I just think like the athletics are such kind of like an intuitive, like, deeper type of activity and that it kind of goes well with um, mindfulness, which is also just kind of learning about being in, in the flow of things and um, learning about how to work, I don't know, to work better, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. That's just a random no, thing I was thinking. Love it. it. Tied right back to basketball. So <laughs> that, yeah, no, he's, he's definitely very like, you know, he's called like Zen master and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, very, like <laughs> just, yeah. And it's, it's funny too, because some of the most successful coaches kind of like, like a Phil Jackson, like if you, if you talk to them, their focus is just like so much more beyond basketball. Like they see like, you know, just, just they, they worry more about like life and more about the bigger picture. And, and that's super helpful too, is that they, you know, see things that are beyond basketball as being important. And then I think that helps them be successful. So that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I want to thank you uh, again for, for your insight. Uh, this is great. This was really helpful and, and just gives us some more understanding and some more uh, tools to just be aware of, of what's going on. And as we know, you know, teenage lives are so complicated and there's so many different things going on and that um, we don't know. We could be the, the one as a coach who is the one that they look up to. We could be the one who can be the advocate for, for that teen. And so this was a really insightful, just really awesome conversation. So, uh, so many titles I can give you, a social worker, therapist, general <laughs> aw awesome mental health advocate. Um, Eileen Callahan, thank you so much for joining us. This was great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a great conversation. And I completely agree. And I want to mention that uh, you, you have a YouTube channel, don't you? I'm going to plug your YouTube. Yeah, I do. I have um, my Instagram is mainly where I'm at. It's at Eileen underscore family underscore therapist. And Eileen is spelled A-I-L-E-E-N. Um, and then I have a website, EileenKelleher.com. Um, and yeah, I post videos on there. I don't want to hype my YouTube channel too much because uh, it's not as consistent as it could be. But yeah, I'm on Instagram more frequently. So yeah. Great. Check her out. It's great stuff there. So thank you so much. And thank you all those who are 
listening and have listened to this mental health series. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will see you next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.